Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ilyasu Adamu, and I work for the NGO Action for the Development of Local Initiative in Niger, and I am Deputy Executive Secretary. With Adli, we have been working for a long time, supporting communities in ensuring protection on a daily basis. I'm very happy usually to be with you today and to moderate this session on the role of community actors in access to protection as a part of this year's Global Protection Forum. As you know, the humanitarian community currently focuses primarily on access of humanitarian actors to populations in need of protection. In this session, we seek to put a spotlight on the second part of access of humanitarian work which is to expand the understanding of access that is about um, daily, yeah, this, this daily protection. For example, which support can we offer for women and children who must cross a checkpoint to make sure that this checkpoint is uh, safe? It's, for example, which communication can we have with police stations in specific markets to make sure that markets are a safe place to sell and buy in all safety. So this is what we want to talk about. Therefore, we want for this session to be a framework to raise awareness and to influence actors to make them understand that among us, actors' protection, we acknowledge the critical role of communities in their own access to protection. We will try to create um, a moment of reflection um, about tangible actions that we can conduct so that power holders within the current humanitarian system can uh, take the, the action, undertake actions as a minimum, not undermine community protection action and ideally to better support and enable such actions. As you will see on the agenda, we will hear uh, several people. We will first hear the opening remarks of this session, then we will hear um, some speakers about community self-protection, and we will then hear three examples in Burkina Faso, Yemen, and in Colombia afterwards. We will take a moment to talk um, about, uh, to, to allow participants to ask questions. And we will then hear uh, practical steps by INGOs or the Global Protection Cluster, which measures to undertake to support uh, actors in their work. So during this session, we will ask you to share your experience 
there will be some opportunities to do that thanks to tools such as Mentimeter. We will have some polls. Uh, you will be able to add recommendations. So please have your phones or computers ready to be able to participate for this session. We will mention that later. So just before we dive into the presentations and the discussion, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's session. First, we will hear the opening remarks by Joana Darmanin, who is the head of unit of humanitarian aid thematic policies at DG ECHO. Then we will follow the presentation of Melanie Kesmaker wissing who is a protection advisor at Oxfam. Then we will hear uh, the experience of uh, Regis Zugrana, who's protection assistant for aged, um, so associate, Association for la Gestion de l'Environnement et le Développement, based in Burkina Faso. Our fourth speaker is Mustafa Bazara, project manager uh, for Protection Field and Medical Foundation, FMF, and he will talk about Yemen. The next speaker will be Padre Jesus Albero Para, who is the coordinator for the Fundación Solidaria Archidiocena, FSA, in Colombia. Then we will hear Hannah Jordan, who is the regional protection advisor for the Norwegian Refugee Council. Then we will follow the presentation of Samuel Cheng, who is the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. Finally, we will hear the words of Sarah Broad, Senior Policy Specialist for the Swedish International Development Corporation. These will be all the speakers we will hear during this session. So without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome Mrs. Joanna Damana, head, as I was saying, of Unit Humanitarian Aid Thematic Policies at ECHO, and I invite her to take the floor now for her opening remarks. I give you the floor now, Joanna. Merci, uh, Iliasu, and uh, a word of welcome uh, to all of you uh, who have joined uh, online for today's event on the role of protection, community protection actors, case studies. Uh, Joanna, challenges. we're not hearing you. Have you become disconnected? No, I'm here. I can hear her. Can you hear me? Nope. Hear oh, you hear Joanna. it? Okay. Maybe. Better now? Okay, I continue. We continue. Stop me. Okay, yes, continue, merci. Johanna. And a, a word of thanks also uh, at the beginning to Oxfam and the Global Protection uh, Cluster for the uh, invitation. I think, uh, as Ilyasu uh, mentioned, we are all rallying around uh, a key concern of uh, protection of uh, conflict affected populations, which is one of the serious concerns in uh, too many uh, humanitarian uh, contexts. And this is, uh, this is one of the uh, key areas that we have been focusing on as donors over the past year. So today's discussion is something that we very much, uh, very much welcome. Another, uh, another um, issue that uh, is very dear to our heart and, and, and also key for, for today's discussion is the perspective of stepping up uh, our support for local actors. And this is also in line with the grand bargain. And here I just wanted to flag that DG, at DG Echo is currently working on the development of guidance on localization. And uh, a number of you may have participated in the consultation uh, that was held between uh, June and the uh, end of August. And we are now reflecting on the outcomes of uh, that consultation. 
Turning to the focus uh, of our discussion uh, today, uh, it is widely recognized that supporting community-based uh, actors leads to empowering uh, communities, uh, strengthening uh, their resilience and addressing the needs of the most vulnerable members of communities, including in uh, hard to reach uh, areas. It also improves the effectiveness and sustainability of our activities and uh, as such the approach also places the agency rights and dignity uh, of people uh, of concern at the center of uh, programming and i think today's uh, today's event will certainly highlight a number of good examples where uh, this is already underway I want to also touch upon questions related to the issues of uh, humanitarian access. Today's armed conflict, as we are all seeing, are increasingly complex and they are posing significant challenges uh, for humanitarian actors to secure act access to those, uh, to those persons that are in need. As a humanitarian donor, we recognize that in humanitarian context, engaging with all parties uh, to the conflict is absolutely key in order uh, to ensure that vulnerable communities uh, are not left behind. This is a clear precondition for safe and effective humanitarian work. We all understand that ex access can be limited due to various reasons, and this uh, certainly requires humanitarian partners to adapt advocacy uh, strategies to the specific context, stakeholders and patterns in order to address uh, these obstacles. Also, uh, from this perspective, and this is uh, something, uh, something that we hear repeatedly, coordinated advocacy for access, giving, giving, for example, a prominent place to local actors is often uh, critical. And as a donor, we welcome and very much encourage uh, such an approach. While often access is seen uh, as uh, humanitarians uh, going to populations in need, I mean, the present session will focus on another aspect and certainly uh, a more interesting aspect, which is the access by crisis affected communities to protection services and support. The session will, uh, will showcase the role of community-based actors, including national and uh, local organizations, civil societies and community protection structures and leaders in this element of uh, access. Indeed, uh, community uh, actors can play a key role in terms of negotiating for and enabling access for external protection ac ac actors thanks to the uh, influence that they have with networks and possible pre-existing uh, connections with duty, duty bearers. Of course, the issue of trust and understanding of the local context and relevant uh, mechanisms is something which puts, them, uh, which puts them at the heart of this process. I am also pleased that today's uh, session will feature uh, recent research conducted by uh, Oxfam, and this was supported by uh, DG uh, ECHO on community-led advocacy and negotiation for protection, uh, which also includes some, uh, some important uh, recommendations. This uh, research is part of a broader project on collective protection advocacy, and I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to encourage you also to look at another interesting uh, product prepared by Oxfam together with ODI on collaborative uh, advocacy on the protection of civilians in conflict, based, for example, on CAC and, and the OEPA agendas. The research has stressed the importance of complementary advocacy and collaboration between international, national and local organization. In the second part of the session, we will also have a chance to listen to three interactive presentations, uh, as Ilyas already mentioned, from community protection actors in uh, Burkina Faso, Colombia and, uh, and uh, Yemen. And these will give examples of how community-based actors support communities' access uh, to protection and share uh, the challenges uh, that they encounter. In the last uh, part of the session, we will also have a chance to learn more about the recommendations and how to address the different barriers and advance on the role of community protection actors. 
while the community protection actors play an important role, the most effective influencing strategies seem to be based on complementarity, mutually reinforcing action at the global and uh, also at the local level. So it seems like we have a very, uh, very interesting uh, session uh, ahead of us, and I'm sure that you will all enjoy uh, this panel. Um, as uh, as uh, Ilyasu also mentioned, please be uh, as interactive uh, as uh, as possible, and we greatly count on your participation. So without uh, much more ado, I will hand the floor now to Melanie Casemaker wissing who is the Protection Advisor in uh, Oxfam. And Melanie will present the main results from the research on the work of local and community protection actors. Melanie, over to you. Thank you very much, Joanna, for these opening remarks. Um, and hello to everyone. So I will talk now about what community uh, self-protection and community-led protection mean to us in the session. And then I will focus on the um, initial research results that Joanna has already uh, referred to that are on how community actors influence duty bearers to ensure access to protection. As you certainly all know, every day community actors carry out actions that help their communities access protection. And this could be helping a survivor of violence access medical or legal assistance, or it can be negotiating for a woman or child to be able to pass safely through a checkpoint on their way to school, on the way to the market, or to access humanitarian aid. And for the, us, this is what self-protection means. It refers to what people and communities do to ensure their own protection. And the way that in external actors can support community self-protection is through community-based or community-led protection. And these are approaches that support the capacity and the agency of affected communities in their own, own protection. And the difference between the two is uh, within the degree of the power that communities hold in the action. So, for instance, the question whether it's external or the community itself that initiates specific actions. Before I go into the research results, um, we would like to gather some of your thoughts and experience on, on this topic through some interactive questions. Um, so, please participate by clicking on the link in the chat box that you will see appear. We have a total of three questions. And um, we have the translation of the question as well here in the chat box because it didn't fit um, into the Mentimeter um, um, platform. So please give us one example of when a community member would need to convince or influence a duty bearer to prevent violence or improve community safety. So I already gave an example which is, for instance, negotiating at checkpoints for people to be able to pass to go to school, to the market, or to access humanitarian aid. And I see the first examples are already arriving. Um, we have, for instance, in situations of large-scale evictions of IDPs. Yes. Um, reducing or preventing the recruitment of children. Another example of recruitment of children. And um, when armed actors come to take crops to steal goods. Yes. Recruitment again. Um, when uh, armed actors are present in the village market, making people feel unsafe. Um, also in the case of night patrols, making complaints to community leaders who are who are taxing um, human existence. Getting past checkpoints to access basic health care. To have no armed present, no armed actors present in schools. Lots of very, very interesting and pertinent examples. Um, access to markets and land. Again, getting past checkpoints, um, preventing forced displacement or forced relocation as well. And we will hear actually an example of forced eviction um, later in one of the examples. Great, lots of examples here. Then I suggest we move to the next question, the second one, which is who works to ensure daily access to prevent or respond to violence in a community? Who does this sort of work? Um, we have one response so far. Let's see what the others are saying. Okay, still up. Yes, the, question, the answers are coming up. Um, community leaders, 
women leaders, traditional elders, humanitarian actors. Women's groups, indigenous, human rights defenders, yes. Lots, lots of community actors I can see here already. Great. Women in traditional, yeah. Local governments, local authorities. Yes. <laughs> Okay, small community actors. Okay, then let's move to the last question. In what ways do community actors facilitate access to services and stakeholders uh, to prevent or respond to violence? Through capacity building, oh, through speaking local languages, through direct dialogues. Mediation and advocacy, through sharing information, building trust. Yeah. I'm also seeing in the chat box some other examples, um, advocacy referrals. Yes, negotiating access. Okay, I wait for a few more. Okay. Sensitization, negotiating with other groups. Thank you. Dialogue, yes. And we will hear more about dialogues in one of the presentations. Thank you very much all for having shared your thoughts. Um, I will now on the next slide move to um, the, the early results of the research that Joanna mentioned, which we conducted into, which we commissioned, um, looking at community-led advocacy negotiation. Um, we have a snapshot of the results that we will share after the event, and the full report will be available later this year. Um, so I want to focus on, on four main things. And the first one is the importance of family and community networks. Community production actors have extensive networks and relationships in their communities, and that includes um, extended family relationships. And they use them to influence the behavior of duty bearers. Um, these networks are most effective when they existed before the crisis. Um, but they can also be built during a crisis. Speaking the same language is another important point. Um, community protection actors understand local duty bearers and speak the language. And this is not just um, the, the actual language, but also knowing and understanding the ideology of duty bearers, their history, motivations, goals, pressure, their pressure points, values, and cultural influences. And community actors use multiple tactics. They can include the approaches that are familiar to international actors, but also a range of context-specific approaches, including community dialogues that have been mentioned. Um, another important factor is the complementarity between local, national, and international actors. And a strong collaboration um, between, between them um, between a diverse range of actors with different backgrounds, perspectives, and networks gives strength to, the, to effective influencing and negotiation, where everyone can play to their strength. Managing the risk is also very important because this work always entails risk, of course. And for community and local actors, the risks are actually quite different from the ones that are faced by national and international actors. The letter leave at the end of a response, but community actors and their families stay behind. And international actors may trigger uh, dangers to local actors and their families, and they might transfer risks to local actors as well. So if we then look at the next slide, um, we can look at some of the recommendations 
that come both from the research and recent discussions um, with national and international protection actors that we've had in different events and roundtables lately. One is to strengthen local um, to global and back to local complementarity and facilitate local actors access to decision making uh, platforms and resources. We also need to foster equal partnerships, cultivate trust between different actors and invest in building sustainable relationships. We have to recognize the skills and experience that are at all levels and with, with each actor and encourage mutual capacity building. Um, we need to invest in managing risks um, and include risk management and support mechanisms into partnerships and also exit planning. When it comes to funding and program design, we need more flexible funding and we have to move away from preset deliverables um, and allow for deliverables, outputs and outcomes to be decided by communities. And finally, um, we have a often heard a recommendation lately that is about gathering learning and good practices when it comes to community-led protection work and providing direction on principles and quality standards on it. Thank you all and back to you, Ilyasu. Merci, Melanie. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you for sharing all these very interesting results. So we uh, will send to you and we'll listen uh, to you while talking about the way the communities and the uh, the community actors are uh, doing some advocacy, advocacy and advocating and uh, negotiating the the access. And you also mentioned about how the community actors can uh, base their actions, and it's extremely interesting. And now. I will ask you to to move on to three uh, concrete examples uh, from Burkina Faso, from Yemen, and from Colombia. Then, and will tell us uh, how uh, the approach, um, uh, what the approaches of the uh, the community uh, actors are, so we can have the access to protection. And the first example will be uh, given by Regis and he's an assistant, a protection as assistant for the association for the management of uh, development and environment in Burkina Faso. Thank you, Regis. You now have the floor. Thank you very much, Ilyasu, and good afternoon, and good morning, good evening, everyone. So our presentation will uh, focus on the how the community actors can uh, f um, facilitate the, uh, the access to protection and I would like to summarize and give you some elements of context uh, of the current situation in Burkina Faso and the needs for protection in 2022. It must be said that currently that this uh, current security situation is very difficult and volatile and we also are facing a crisis. Uh, we have an increase in the risk related to protection because um, the, situ uh, the situation is worsening. And furthermore, we're also facing a food crisis and it uh, exacerbates uh, the current situation. And it may present some risks, uh, for example, uh, uh, protection being refused or the most necessary services being refused. Um, the political crisis after the coup by uh, the military at the beginning of the year 2022 and in September 2022 with uh, some uh, constraints on human rights and violation of human rights. But furthermore, we also have uh, the displacements of many people in the, in the country. Uh, about the uh, humanitarian needs in 2022, it must be said we must be say that more than 3.5 million people are in need of humanitarian needs and and more than 2.1 million people need um, a protection and most of them are need this protection against uh, gender-based violence because we know that the the regions close to Sahel uh, are mostly impacted with more than 55.2 uh, 
percent of the people in the region are impacted. And so on a population of one more than one million people living in the area. So we have to close school and it has, of course, an impact on many uh, pupils and students. And of course, uh, uh, health institutes has to close their doors and is worsening the current situation and the health crisis. So while facing all these needs and because of the current situation, so we have to do, to have new brand new initiatives. So we have the we have the action plans, a community based action plans. So so in order to help the community based institutions, so they can describe uh, the current uh, threats and the current needs, and can make recommendations for specific aids in order to mitigate uh, the risks. This is a very efficient way to help the members of what we call the SPC, the, the management centers and management departments. So, and the community-based protection structures. So they can um, plan um, initiatives and so they can strengthen the, uh, the um, protection effort in the region. So let's move on to the next slide. So we also have what we call a, a community-based dialogue. So it, and it's about advocacy and we need to support all the communities so they can get access to protection. And this activity allows the members of the SPC, the community based protection uh, services, so they can send advocacy notes on specific topics, for example, uh, sexual uh, violence, gender based violence, rapes, uh, kidnappings, so they can actually define uh, efficient um, activities in order to prevent these violations of human rights, in order to counter this uh, and prevent these uh, violations of human rights. Next slide, please. We also have a mapping, mapping activity of these uh, community protection centers. And this is it's at the core of what we do. So we can make sure that this member of these communities can get access to this uh, protection. That we are working hand in hand with uh, communities, with the SPCs. So we have mapping of all the available services and they've been uh, distributed among the communities. So it makes things easier for any better access uh, to this uh, protection. Next slide, please. So we can note that we have some uh, very good achievements. We must say that the fact that we have the SPC, these community protection centers, uh, really uh, helped us to to reduce the uh, the number of violations of human rights of human rights. So we have these uh, discussions and negotiations, and and the presence of these uh, local authorities of local community leaders the representatives of the uh, community protection centers of men, women, and uh, customary authorities and the host communities uh, participated to these meetings. And we have a very frank and open discussions and we counting on the contribution of everyone and to be as honest as possible. And so all the the actors are expressing themselves and the, uh, the talk about the uh, problems they're facing and they try to find solutions with the authorities and they try to draft some um, roadmaps and action plans. And it must also be noted that these SPC have received some funds thanks to the uh, community protection plan and the uh, uh, the activities for uh, social cohesion, for example, we had we, the healthiness days 
or hygiene days for uh, host populations and IDPs. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So now we have a testimony of uh, Mrs. Sao. She is a member of the Community Protection Center and the uh, the Women's Community uh, Association in the district of Wendu. It, with this testimony, she shows that thanks to AGED and Oxfam, the, uh, the women in the region has been able to, to draft some uh, protection uh, plans. And thanks to that, they've been able to receive They've been able to receive uh, some funds, thanks uh, notably to the municipality of Dori, Dori, but also from the uh, from the RCR, and also the Children Believe. So, uh, so thanks to the RCR, they have been able to have like uh, empowerment activities and uh, for the protection of children and girls. Move on to the next slide. There was another testimony that thanks to the early warning system, we uh, were uh, notified of several sexual and physical aggression and of rapes at the bridge linking the town center of Dori to Wendu and in some uh, Wendu neighborhood places. So with this fact, the community protection structures have undertaken advocacy with the authorities to have more safety in these places. And they also have led uh, awareness campaigns with communities to reduce their vulnerabilities uh, faced with these risks. Uh, next slide, please. With these activities, we can also note some major challenges. In particular, the protection response, and especially when it's led by the community itself, has a weak rate of funding and for some actors or donors is not an operational priority. The increase of protection incidents because of the safety crisis and the destruction of water infrastructures, uh, depriving deliberately the population of their rights to water, to education, healthcare, and to information. There is a weak capacity of a fast response to urgent needs of populations when it comes to protection because of the lack of flexible funds easily usable to facilitate the access to protection services. There's also the fact that many local organizations do not have a strategic vision on protection matters. This stays the priority of international actors such as Oxfam, DRC, NRC, that is taking over the logic of localizations, wanting that local actors are placed in the center of the response. Uh, next slide, please. With these challenges, we recommend the following recommendations to work to strengthen protection programs thanks to a community protection approach in ensuring um, funding and in the long term in favor of protection action to facilitate the access of protection services, we also need to strengthen protection mechanisms and the localization of the response while having flexible funds to meet urgent needs when it comes to protection and to make sure that it is sustainable. We also need to lead actions, advocacy actions with the government and to have stabilization missions and peace missions to strengthen the protection of civilians and of their um, uh, goods. And next slide, please. 
Thank you. We are reaching the end of this presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Iliasu. Thank you very much, Regis, for this presentation and for this example that show us how communities develop action plans to guarantee the protection of the population. And yes, I thank you very much. Dear Regis, we will now move on to our next speaker, who is Mustafa Bazara, project manager of protection at Field Medical Foundation in Yemen. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Eliaso. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about uh, community based protection and our experience and the challenges that uh, we faced uh, in the field. Next slide, please. As shown in the picture, uh, since 2015, uh, Yemen uh, is in a war uh, and remains one of the largest humanitarian crises and aid operation in the world. The crisis is uh, a result of uh, an armed conflict that escalated seven uh, years ago. It has killed and injured ten of thousands of civilians um, causing uh, huge suffering for Yemeni people. Next slide, please. Um, most vulnerable people uh, suffer from protection threats such as uh, violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation. Uh, women are looking at them as uh, inferior to men. Um, and young girls also uh, married before the age of uh, 15. Uh, child brides, uh, as usual, exposed to uh, sexual and uh, physical violence and uh, emotional abuse. Uh, domestic violence uh, is rarely reported due to social stigma and uh, shame. Uh, as we all know, uh, Yemen is uh, a tribal country, which means uh, there are cultural norms and uh, attitude um, that cause more discrimination against uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, one of uh, these groups uh, is Muhammadin, marginalized one. Um, and here in Yemen is uh, called uh, the Muhammadin Akhdam, um, meaning servant. Uh, next slide, please. In the Muhammadin community, um, young men uh, got involved uh, in the fighting uh, with parties uh, as a negative coping mechanism. Uh, due to uh, lack of uh, income of uh, education opportunities uh, in order to support their uh, families uh, to make uh, ends meet. Uh, this causes many challenges like uh, the lack of medical treatment when injured uh, and uh, support for mental health issues or uh, trauma. Uh, so their families uh, are exposed to harassment and abuse uh, while their men are away. Uh, as well as uh, Muhammadin children uh, face difficulties to get uh, enough education opportunities and also uh, face bullying and harassment uh, from their peers in the school, which uh, led their families uh, to engage them uh, in begging uh, to survive. Uh, so FMF supports uh, CBBNs uh, by adopting AGD approach um, in order to um, engage the community uh, in the process um, and to get uh, info, um, enough info about the protection uh, threats uh, that they face. Uh, so uh, I will present you uh, two examples um, of how CBBNs help their communities uh, to access uh, protection. Next slide, please. This is a picture of uh, a displacement site uh, in Adal Governorate, uh, where the Muhammadin uh, got an eviction notice uh, from the landowner. Um, as shown, uh, they live uh, in makeshift shelter um, with uh, terrible condition, and uh, also they can't uh, be moved. Uh, CBBN members um, flag it out uh, the issue by communicating the CBBN focal point uh, via WhatsApp group. Um, in order to inform the protection officer to uh, advocate uh, and uh, 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 develop and, uh, and to do advocate and uh, to the relevant uh, clusters uh, for uh, uh, relocation, uh, they also uh, communicate with the community leaders uh, to involve them in the mediation uh, with the landowner 
to uh, extend the eviction notice. Uh, also, at that moment, uh, CBBNs uh, informed the local uh, authorities about the issue uh, in order to uh, push uh, them to find uh, another uh, suitable location. Uh, the collaboration between the local authorities and the uh, clusters was uh, successfully in finding uh, suitable location uh, to have um, safe access to uh, services. Also, the CBBN helped uh, the protection monitors and the cluster teams um, to gather uh, information uh, when conducting the multi-cluster land uh, suitability uh, that looked uh, for uh, potential uh, protection risks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other impact uh, that is caused uh, by the tribal uh, tradition in, uh, is, is, uh, is the discrimination uh, against women, uh, where women uh, are more exposed to uh, the risk of GBV during displacement um, due to their economic instability, uh, lack of uh, proper living conditions, um, and service uh, providing. Uh, also, women um, have taken uh, some measures uh, like sleeping in groups uh, and walking together to feed uh, firewood uh, and water uh, in order to avoid any um, protection threats like killing, uh, rape, uh, sexual harassment, uh, and assault. Um, also, identification uh, is common practice uh, due to the lack of uh, latrines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as shown in the picture, in the pictures, uh, this is uh, as an IDB site, an IDB site uh, called Wadi Al Qarna in Abin Governorate, where IDBs uh, were having difficulties uh, accessing water because uh, of an issue with the, the water uh, facility in the village. Uh, because of that, uh, everyone was uh, forcing to go fetch uh, water from the main tank, uh, causing overcrowding uh, at that location. Um, which lead to harassment and abuse of women uh, and girls. Uh, also, some women uh, were forced to walk long distance to feed water due to not having enough uh, water, uh, which exposed them to more uh, protection uh, risks. Uh, so um, the, uh, the woman came and told the CBBN females, uh, female members uh, about what they uh, were exposed to. Uh, so uh, CBBNs uh, raised uh, the issue to the CBBN focal point in order uh, to advocate and send the FMF uh, protection team to assess uh, the situation. Uh, after that, uh, the protection team uh, conduct a visit uh, to the site to the site um, and conduct uh, FGDs uh, with the help of CBBN member uh, and gather uh, info and assemble the participants. Uh, the results. Uh, the result was uh, that FMF uh, implemented um, a quick impact project and engaged the community as uh, cash for work. Uh, also, uh, the project was uh, by raising uh, the existing main tank uh, and adding three more uh, sub tanks, uh, as well as inst uh, installing uh, solar lamps uh, on the site. Uh, also, CBBN uh, played. Uh, a role in organizing groups uh, when featuring uh, water to avoid any uh, possible crowding. Next slide, please. Um, here we have uh, some challenges uh, that we like to uh, share with you. Uh, first, uh, lack of specialized protection services uh, to mitigate and address protection risks. Uh, second, uh, increase, uh, increased vulnerabilities, uh, particularly in area where uh, national uh, facilities are uh, malfunctioning uh, and destroyed. Uh, norms and uh, traditions uh, have caused uh, many challenges, uh, in, uh, including difficulties in resolving uh, issues with the mediation, uh, also preventing women uh, from uh, participating uh, as a CBBN's member uh, in some areas that uh, have deeply uh, rooted uh, norms. Uh, fourth, uh, difficulties uh, when trying uh, to communicate with the CBBNs due to poor uh, network coverage. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Here we have uh, the recommendations. Uh, first, uh, increasing uh, and mobilizing uh, resource in order to strengthen uh, protection services. Uh, double the efforts uh, to support the capacities of vulnerable communities and groups in order to increase uh, empowerment and resilience. Uh, third, uh, support educational uh, programs in order to uh, contribute to the uh, overall efforts to, do, uh, to reduce the negative uh, traditional uh, norms and uh, beliefs. Uh, thank you, uh, and over to you, uh, Eliso. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Thank you for sharing these examples, showing that accessing the network allowed to reduce some problem of forced eviction or of violence based on gender linked to the access of water. But thank you also for sharing with us the story of the challenges that uh, you are facing and the networks that you are supporting. Thank you. We are now moving to our last presentation. It will be a presentation by Padre Jesus Albero, who comes from Colombia and is the coordinator of the FSA. I will give you the floor now. Good morning, afternoon or evening for all of you who are participating in this great protection forum. I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, area of work. We work together with the NRC and we are dealing with uh, uh, matters in uh, the Department of Chopo, the area of Chopo and in the northwestern area of Colombia. Colombia is a country with 70 million people and we have been dragging behind us uh, armed conflict with uh, far left organizations and throughout the uh, past few years we've seen the uh, onset uh, um, development of uh, far right groups clashing against the authorities and in these clashes in this uh, war there are many political and strategic interests that actually affect the whole of the country. So right now, the situation and our humanitarian crisis is really deep, and this really um, impacts on many things. And we are seeing the recruitment of uh, girls and boys, uh, abuse of women, violence against women, gender-based violence, and right now, in Colombia, we see 10 million people who are victims of this armed conflict, and it, it is producing a lot of problems, confinement, displacement, threats, homicides, etc. And uh, I, you know, we've had a peace process that should have been ongoing. But what concerns uh, the area where we work, well, in Colombia, we have certain ethnic minorities. And in this region I'm talking about is where we have most of our indigenous population, 80%. We have black communities, the 15% indigenous population is 10% uh, and a 5% of mixed race people, but also considered indigenous people. And our region would have half a million population. And I would say as well that most people are victims of this conflict. And there's a deep humanitarian crisis. Um, and the result or how this translates into reality is confinement, displacement, forced recruitment. And amongst all this, uh, this great humanitarian crisis, the Catholic Church is here. And we have been working for many years uh, trying to help the indigenous peoples. And I'm going to talk about our accompaniment work and how we help these communities. You can see on the map and how whatever they work, they work uh, that 
they live. They live in the mountains, they live uh, near the basins of rivers, and how they're affected by armed groups in the past few years. From the viewpoint of the church, uh, exercise is to accompany people and to help them, um, to help these communities, these ethnic communities who, are, who lived in their own territories and they have their own uh, ethnic authorities, if you will, indigenous authorities. So we have been trying to strengthen the capacity of organization, their self-governing power, everything that has to do with being self-determined. And as a result of the armed conflict, it has been hugely difficult to be able to have uh, communities strengthening those powers. So this humanitarian accompaniment that the church uh, carries out um, in the church, but not just the church, also there are many other organizations, also the UN organizations are there, many NGOs are working with us as well. We just try to go hand in hand with the uh, indigenous people. And we have done some case studies, uh, so we can see what's happening. What has been a community protection work? Well, we um, have, we've decided, I beg your pardon, to go with the living plans or life plans of the indigenous people. And this means self-community, self-protection for the communities. And this means that we have helped the communities so they can uh, formulate and organize their own inter internal rules of engagement uh, so they could uh, follow their own traditions. And in Colombia, the indigenous people work very well together. And you have the warden, the indigenous warden is a, is a figure that is the person that protects or is seen to protect and is culturally a very important figure. And in fact, they are represented by a staff and they use their own language, they use the staff, these wardens, and they're representative of the power and the strength of the communities. Um, and near the river Baudo, apart from humanitarian aid, we have provided, again, accompaniment, access to health services and um, health facilities. We do a lot of advocacy work with the local authorities and with the regional authorities and the national authorities. And this is one of the main big problems in Colombia for the whole country is that there's a vacuum uh, of power, uh, of uh, institutional power, particularly in some of these regions. And together with this accompaniment, the church and other organizations and the communities, um, we have we have had to deal with a lot of uh, armed conflict, drug trafficking, uh, the cartels, um, uh, criminal organizations, organized crime organizations. And we thought the only way forward is political negotiation. It is dialogue. That's the only way forward for us. And in this respect, we have been supporting the peace process that started in 2012. Let us remember that with the FARC, the oldest guerrilla in Colombia, when they laid down their arms and signed the peace uh, agreement with the government, with the government. And we have been trying to implement such agreements. However, there are other interests, there are many other groups. And since 2017, we try to uh, initiate or bring about another peace process with the National Liberation Army. Um, but this wasn't very successful because with Duca's government between 2018 to 2022, and there were many problems with uh, because they didn't want to continue implementing the peace process and they didn't want to negotiate. What happened? Um, what happened was that the whole of Colombia and particularly in Chopo as a region 
this uh, Liberation Army has spread everywhere and their activities are rife. Um, and also there are other groups, uh, dissident groups uh, from the guerrillas that didn't each actually didn't want to go into the peace process. These are far right groups. And here we call them, uh, there's one called the Gulf, the Gulf Plan and, um, and they are paramilitary organizations. And of course there is still, you know, the, the uh, drug trade, um, there are other organized crime organizations that um, exploit uh, this to their advantage. So since 2018, what we have seen is a huge and deep humanitarian crisis. We have just worked for the communities. Um, and as I said, we have tried to do a lot of actions, implement a lot of actions, the work with working with women, working with uh, girls and work through educational uh, instances. And now we have a new government, uh, the government of President Petro. We're thinking this is the government of change and we have a new policy called total peace, all out peace and our advocacy work, which is through uh, humanitarian dialogues, is something that now we're doing constantly and systematically. And thanks to the alliance that we have with the NRC and being supported by the Norwegian embassy uh, from the church, um, we have managed to move forward in our negotiations with some some of the groups some of these guerrilla groups and some of these armed groups and um, we have uh, held some exploratory dialogues um, and as i was saying this has always been done hand in hand with the authorities in all these territories in the case I mentioned in this indigenous community and through the river of San Juan, San Antonio and other rivers, we've been working on this, on establishing this dialogue and opening these spaces to talk with the leaders of these guerrillas, of these armed groups, to see how we can reach some uh, cohabitation agreements, how we can reach some minimum requirements for coexistence, and we've been fighting to achieve this uh, coexistence agreements and to make them, uh, to materialize them. And these agreements include the right to life so that leaders are not murdered or persecuted. Because right now, in this very region, over 54 leaders have been murdered. And for us, that is a huge number. There are permanent threats. So through these dialogues that we hold within the communities, we managed to remove the threats to leaders or to reduce those threats and to allow them to, to remain in their communities. However, there are instances in which we need to remove them from these communities. And that is where the church and, and, and the NRC has decided to create a fund to protect these leaders in order to relocate them and there uh, the church has these safe houses for them to stay at. We also have another very strong uh, protection strategy. It's what we've called churches as peace sanctuaries. These are priests or nuns who are throughout all the territories in all the parishes or in mission centers and they are there and provide accompaniment on a daily basis, both to community leaders, to communities, to schools, and they go there so as to advocate before the state or before the government or before armed groups. And we owe this to mitigate this humanitarian tragedy. Right now, in these moments, we are currently waiting for 
Petro's government to start, because they already said they would start some peace dialogues with the ELN uh, guerrilla in this region, because here they hold great territorial control. So we are, uh, we, we are expecting to see what will happen. And here's where the church can act to facilitate these meetings, to bear all these initi initiatives like uh, indigenous guards, to guarantee the respect for schools. And I will now finish. Hello? Apparently there's an interruction. It would be nice if you could go to a conclusion. Because if you could do your conclusion of your speech, thank you. Yes, I was about to finish, and I wanted to say a number of recommendations, a series of recommendations that were actually mentioned by the uh, speaker this morning. One of them is to advance in a national humanitarian program. We've been working on that already as part of civil society we think that with all that with in, international cooperation we will be able to advocate before governments and those who hold the power not only governmental power but also business power because there are many interests in the region for this and the entire un local coordination team and humanitarian teams they are all working to articulate and coordinate the efforts in the territory and this should continue lastly i would like to say that we need to manage not just financial resources but also the presence of staff not, not only of international organizations but from national uh, representatives that can help us manage this humanitarian crisis this is like a very general overview i thank you for your time and we will keep on working for the end of this war and armed conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Albero, for all these and many examples you you mentioned. It, it's very important. Uh, uh, now we have to move on to the q and a session uh, the question asked by uh, our audience to the, the our speakers and we have a question from from mr uh, mustafa and to regis and the question if i can find the question is a, have you been able to to see uh, some uh, a change in terms of the satisfaction of your beneficiaries. Do you have some uh, info about this? And then we'll start maybe Bridges, and then we'll move on to Mustafa. Thank and the question was how to, how at the very end of your projects, are they are your beneficiaries satisfied by your projects? Thank you very much, Ilyasu. And uh, about this I would say that the the, the town of Duri uh, in the suburbs of uh, Wendu. So we have the action of the community protection um, centers has been extremely positive because thanks to the advocacy and the, uh, the raising awareness among the population, it really helped us to reduce the, uh, the risks and mitigate the risks of protection, most notably the uh, cases of rapes. For example, we have more than 10 rapes per month and after a few weeks, we only have what is six, um, six rapes per month, but in Dupont and uh, around Mendu. And, and we now we only got two or three rapes. So I would say there was no such a threat for the local communities. Thank you very much, Regis. And now we'll give the floor to Mustafa to hear his answer. Maybe you could say a few words, Mustafa. Uh, sorry, could you 
Can you elaborate more? La question est de savoir. The question was to know is are you the beneficiaries of your project satisfied with your your project? Are they? Have you see? I've noticed any changes among in the satisfaction of your beneficiaries. Mustafa, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Um, after uh, finished the uh, the project, we contacted the FGD to uh, see uh, the satisfied of uh, the beneficiaries, um, and uh, we saw that. Uh, the beneficiary, uh, the beneficiaries is uh, also uh, justified, and uh, we uh, didn't uh, uh, go to fetching water from uh, long distance. Um, also, uh, CBBN organized uh, the, uh, the the groups when uh, fetching uh, uh, water in order to uh, avoid any crowding or uh, any harassment and abuse. Over to you, Elaso. Thank you very much, Mustafa. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Albero. And the idea was to know uh, what was the most difficult part of you and most with your job, and most notably with how you could influence the, the main stakeholders, in including the armed groups. Albero, you have the floor. Yes, I think the most difficult part has been to reach the leaders, the heads of these armed groups. That is why they've decided to change strategies so as to avoid any responsibilities. They know there there is an imminent uh, peace agreement that they may be uh, subject to international law. So for us, because we open these dialogues, it is hard to reach these leaders. This would be the first uh, difficulty. And the second one would be there have been uh, there have been some uh, uh, an important turnover in these armed groups. And so it is very difficult because they change over and over. And when you go and talk to them and you tell them that they need to abide by international humanitarian law, and that they should not recruit boys or girls or kidnap or commit any uh, sexual abuses against women, they don't have this knowledge. And we have to face this, to overcome this hurdle. And that is why we need to provide training on IHL, because they don't have any training of on this. They are in these groups because they are being paid or because they are brought to this to this group. So that would be another obstacle. The third one or the third difficulty would be that it is quite difficult for us because right now in some areas, there is some uh, work of uh, law enforcement agencies and armed groups and as facilitator, they might think that you are involved in legal issues. That is why we conduct this mediation without any authorization. We follow our own religious principles. And lastly, a very uh, important obstacle is when there are leaders or people from the community, they decide to they decide to, to go with these armed groups and then start threatening their own families and communities. And this is bringing a lot of problems to communities. So, great. Thank you. We'll listen to some very concrete examples of um, activities carried out by the uh, community actors. And now we are going and after Having listened to all these uh, interesting examples of the, the quality uh, of quality uh, done with the communities and themselves to ensure that uh, the protection. So we also listen to the um, to the uh, the speakers talking about the, the the challenges and all the recommendations. 
and most notably the recommendations to the uh, international organizations and also the UN agencies and all the humanitarian organizations in order to strengthen and to support uh, better all the, the actors of uh, protection on the local level. I think that given the time we have left, we're not going to go back to your recommendations and your, your advice. So now it's open and the uh, it's always the, the chat box is always open and the system is always open saying you can always uh, drop your core recommendations. Uh, if you allow me, I'll give the floor to Anna. She's a advi regional advisor for protection. So I wanted to ask uh, Anna, what are the practical actions which, according to you, the uh, international organization could carry out in order to ease and facilitate the access to protection. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Ilya Su, and I really appreciate being here today. It's so wonderful to see everybody and to see all of the participants. Um, before I speak on some of the barriers, um, I did also want to, and please, Melanie, make sure that I'm doing this correctly, just wanted to link over to a mirror board that we've actually made that outlines some of the specific recommendations that our, um, that our panelists um, have spoken about. Um, so in front of you, you will see a mirror board that is translated into English, French, and Spanish. Um, the link is open, so everyone should be able to have access to it. And we just wanted to provide this as a participatory way to really receive feedback and concrete solutions and recommendations from everyone. We will keep this mirror board open for a week. So you have plenty of time to go back and to provide some recommendations, but we've given you sticky notes and you can add recommendations as well. So we've taken the recommendations from our panelists um, but please add as much as you um, feel as you wish. And um, it's really just a way for us to also um, come together and, and have the way to, um, to, to get your feedback on what are some actionable recommendations um, to moving um, community self-protection programming and community-led programming forward. Um, so thank you very much, Melanie, for sharing your screen. And then I will just speak a little bit about the barriers um, and how we can address and find solutions to some of more of the um, instructional or let's say um, structural barriers to community self-protection. So as I said, um, my name is Hannah Jordan and I work with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, now, if you're a protection actor who has implemented programs, you're aware of the challenges that most of us face, namely restrictive log frames, strict programming narratives, m and &E methodologies that may limit our ability to collect, analyze, and use qualitative data, um, conflicting implementation priorities, access challenges. And one thing that I've observed this week, listening to all of the previous sessions, and that has come out really strongly for me is that the role and really the agency of community protection actors and the role that these individuals play in negotiating for their own access and protection and the role that they play in identifying strategies to increase their safety, the safety of their communities and to prevent violence. Um, and also how external actors like INGOs can support and strengthen these strategies to actions. And one thing is that I've noticed that these barriers have stood out to me, but most importantly, there are so many solutions that we have already identified. Although the barriers that I've mentioned, um, some of our institutional, some are structural, some are architectural, um, we have capacity to change some of these. By creating community-led indicators and log frames, we're able to remain accountable to our organizations and donors while structurally breaking down some of the barriers that may limit our ability and the ability of our grants to really be implemented and led by communities. Also by building a central relationships with communities and really being present. So we talk about the protection by presence. Um, with communities as partners, we are able to break down some, not all, but some of these access and security challenges. Having broad budget lines gives us the flexibility to also support communities with their own strategies, regardless of how that strategy may fit within the structure of the humanitarian system 
emphasizing cross-sectoral integration and multidisciplinary strategies to reduce risk. Through creatively looking beyond the humanitarian sector, we are able to find and use innovative monitoring and evaluation meth methodologies and systems that have been used for a very long time within academia, the peace building and development sectors that focus on qualitative practice for collecting, analyzing and using data. And I've noticed just to wrap up that so many organizations, both national and international have already demonstrated that it's possible to break down these barriers and it's possible and they've shared their experiences and lessons learned about how to address these challenges. Um, and by breaking down some of these perceived and actual barriers, we're able to start actualizing some of the recommendations that we've presented in this session and also throughout the forum. Ultimately, from the outcome of this forum so far, I think it's very clear that multiple solutions are available to community self-protection programming and community-led programming. And that although we have these barriers, we should also be looking at taking steps to address them. Thank you and over to you, Ilyasu. Uh, merci, Anna. Thank you very much, Hannah, for all the recommendations and the proposals in order to act concretely that uh, the, the main stakeholders can implement in order to strengthen the, the quality and the efficiency of your uh, practices on the ground. I would like to thank you for this, and I would like to welcome Mr. Samuel, Mr. Samuel Chung. You are the coordinator of the uh, Global Protection Cluster. Mr. Samuel, Mr. Samuel Chung, so, according to you, how can the GPC and the national clusters uh, support the uh, the community actors in their uh, daily activities for protection? Uh, merci, uh, Eliasu. Thank you very Thank much you, for Eliasu. giving me the floor. Um, I would first just begin by saying deep thanks to Oxfam, to NRC for organizing such a great discussion and Great to see so much interaction and active participation from everyone online on this critical subject. Uh, this is, as Hannah has mentioned, this is absolutely critical uh, for all of us, this community self-protection and the role of community actors. In many ways, I would consider that this is the litmus test for whether our protection interventions will ultimately result in sustainable protection outcomes. It also holds the key to our discussions around access that protects. Uh, to be clear, this is not just about localization. It's not just about community work. This is about how communities have a role in protection and how this can change the game on how we look at access, shifting it to really access that protects. Um, we've known for a long time that local actors are the first to respond during times of crisis. Typically, they're also the first to feel its impacts. And in most, but not all cases, they will have access to areas and people, including the duty bearers of protection that international actors do not. Uh, given their understanding of the context and all the intricacies of what the protection risks and threats are in a specific place and a time where they are occurring, who's perpetrating them? What's driving them to do what is causing the harm or why are they not doing what is needed uh, that is exacerbating vulnerabilities? They're the ones who can help identify visible as well as invisible vulnerabilities and to help think of solutions that none of us have thought of, leveraging relationships, cultural references, trust to influence through passion, through negotiation, through solidarity, and even through song sometimes, uh, protection outcomes. There absolutely must play a key role in delivering protection and assistance on the ground, including through local context specific programs and providing culturally sensitive services. Their presence within communities before, during and after crises means, well, they're the best place to link immediate response efforts to longer term resilience building, preparedness and recovery. They make protection happen where it counts and they make that protection stick. You know, with all that in mind, working with and strengthening their agency and capacities of self-protection is a priority for an effective response to any protection situation. So what can we as the global protection cluster and the protection community do? 
Well, first we acknowledge that community protection work, community-based protection, and as we've we focused on here, community self-protection is a core and essential to our sector, and it should be properly reflected in our strategic planning, whether it be humanitarian responses, humanitarian needs overviews, funding strategies, and advocacy efforts. And it's also important that these not all be lumped into a generic title of community engagement, but instead be recognized as a key modality for achieving protection. There also seems to be a need to gather and reinforce global learning and good practices on community-based protection and community self-protection more specifically, so that it's not just about localization, which is important, but it is about harnessing them as a means for better achieving protection outcomes, including on protection of civilians, as well as how we can overcome access challenges. On this, the Global Protection Cluster is open to exploring how we can better galvanize our membership to provide direction, principles, standards on community as well as civilian self-protection. For all of us, let us all collectively highlight the need for increased visibility, recognition of community protection actors and their work in both local as well as global fora. This includes ensuring that coordination structures, particularly at subnational level, are proactive in harnessing their expertise and capacities as we design our protection interventions, including through area-based and local action plans. Globally, as the Global Protection Cluster is a space for all members of the network, it is on us to feature national protection leaders from different crisis contexts. And we need to continue to ensure that they have a space at the table and that frontline perspectives and this type of work, which we were discussing and, and, and highlighting today, continues to be amplified across the range of our operational work, our advocacy work, and all the areas that the Global Protection Cluster leads on. On behalf of the Global Protection Cluster and all our areas of responsibility, we do wanna reiterate that this commitment is central to our work. It's reflected in our strategic framework, but including in the objective that we want to ensure that the voices of crisis affected people and communities are heard, especially the forgotten ones, but not only heard, but are critical to the design and part of the agency and the capacity. And may I say absolutely necessary for us to achieve these protection outcomes. So with that, I do want to once again, thank you all for this and, and pledge once again, our support and our commitment from the Global Protection Cluster to follow on this line of work of community protection actors and community self-protection. Thank you very much. Eliasu, back to you. Thank you very much, Samuel, for very specific recommendations. We are uh, really moving, uh, uh, looking forward to, to seeing all these um, uh, the implementation of these recommendations. I'll give the floor to Sarah, Sarah Broad. Thank you very much. Sarah Broad, she's a specialist. Uh, she's a specialist at the SIDA, so Swedish International Development Corporation. Thank you very much. Their participants. I, I think this has been a very important session and at least I learned a lot. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, for us, this is a really, truly important issue. I think during the sessions, we have heard excellent examples of how protection actors work with communities to support community self-protection capacities and how an inclusive humanitarian system ensures that all protection actors are recognized, valued and supported. Community self-protection is a cornerstone in reaching protection outcomes, and we need to learn how to best support and enable this through adopting a truly inclusive, people-centered and community-based approach together with our partners. I think for us as a donor, um, there are many lessons to learn and take forward after this event. Um, I heard partners advocating for flexible and long-term funding to support principled engagement, relationship building, trust, in addition to sustained access and a strong protection response. I think it's also important to better understand and manage risks uh, to avoid just transferring the risks to local partners or to 
to communities. Donors need to be part of and support learning and exchange on best practices that can influence advocacy, uh, guidance and standards, and finding ways of supporting purposeful complementarity between local and global actors is key. There need to be a space for communities to influence and decide outcomes, outputs and deliverables. And community protection structures needs to be diverse and inclusive to consider the risks to all members of a community. I think donors can contribute by not looking uh, at only the number of people reached, but we need to understand and accept that protection outcomes needs to be measured in a more qualitative way. This could mean support to developing and adapting methods that can capture impact in a meaningful way for this type of interventions. Uh, there needs to be understanding that projects like the ones we heard about today may need a larger proportion of the budget allocated to staff compared to more assistant focused projects that would typically be more supply focused. And finally, I think the recommendations from participants included increased funding and support for protection response and for building and effectively using the capacity of communities and groups to increase, increase their own empowerment, resilience and protection. Thank you very much for today and for those important insights. Thank you very much for these very uh, concrete uh, recommendations and uh, comments and uh, very practical comments. And I hope that all the, uh, the participants, they really uh, listen to you and they make the necessary efforts to support and to continue uh, all of your efforts. Thank you very much to all the speakers for your amazing uh, contributions and the quality of the hints and the figures you have brought. Uh, here, you are, we have we listened to you, and we uh, heard all the results. And how we have a very concrete and clear recommendations based on the orientation, and uh, are from the uh, in the 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 many organizations, including the cluster. And I think that uh, all the recommendations are more than welcome. And I, once again, you can keep on sending us new recommendations. So I think that now we are reaching the end of this session. But once again, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to say it was a pleasure to work with you. I would like to thank you all on behalf of Oxfam and uh, NRC and the, the protection group. I would like to thank you all for all your recommendations, your interventions, for the quality of work that is being carried out as we speak on the ground. And we uh, we are keep on working together for have bring a better protection to all the many uh, the many communities and populations. So we would like to thank you all for your contribution to this debate, and I would like to say we have amazing discussions. Thank you very much. I would wish you a nice afternoon, a nice evening, and see you soon.